Hi there, I'm Black Riot, broadcasting out of the UK into your homes. Um, if it's the first time you're passing through, welcome to my channel. For my return subscribers, lovely to see you. Welcome. Um, then this video, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to play a video. I'd appreciate your comments. And yes, that's all I'm going to say. It's one of those videos that for once in a, once in a blue moon, I keep my mouth shut. This is one of them. Jamaica is a country famous for reggae music, ska music, Bob Barley, sprinters such as Usain Bolt's marvellous beaches, and the Rastafarian religion. And all of this comes from a tiny island with only around 3 million inhabitants. Culture-wise, we could say Jamaica is a giant. It's likely you know someone who is planning to spend his or her holidays in a nice resort on some gorgeous Jamaican beach. But there is also a reason why you've never heard of anybody saying, oh yes, I'm going to invest some money in the lands of Bob Marley, or my company is sending me to our office in Kingston. In fact, I bet nobody here could name the Prime Minister or indeed the currency of Jamaica. Yes, when it comes to international supply chains, Jamaica is as irrelevant as the food pics that your girlfriend posts on her Instagram. <laughs> The nation is as poor as Armenia or the Philippines. At least this is how it used to be, because things, they're now beginning to change. Check this out. Jamaica plans an air and logistics hub. Developers envision a trading center on the order of Singapore, Dubai, and Rotterdam. Now to imagine Jamaica going from laid-back jungle island to the likes of Singapore or the Netherlands might seem like a bit of a stretch. But when you think about it, it's a great solution for this lackluster economy and Jamaica is very well situated for this. Just look at this shipping map. As you can see, Jamaica is located near the Panama Canal. This means that a lot of ships pass by the islands and may need to stop and refuel or even to store some of their cargo. Yes, it's possible to do both of these things in Panama itself, but it has become increasingly expensive. This explains why Kingston has already snagged quite a lot of shipping traffic. Now add to this the fact that the Panama Canal has recently undergone a massive expansion and that Jamaica's only competition are other island nations such as Cuba and Haiti, then it's clear that Jamaica has a real shot here. What's more, unlike its island neighbors, Jamaica is an English-speaking country. So any American investor who wants to open a warehouse, they couldn't have it easier. Great location, cheap salaries, and everything's in English. So now the question is, can it actually happen? Can Jamaica achieve a level of wealth on par with the Dutch? Well, today we're going to answer these questions, but before we do, let's take a look back at the history. Prosperity lost. On the 6th of August 1962, Jamaica gained independence from the British Empire. It was a peaceful transition and they went on to form a two-party parliamentary republic in the Westminster style, which is the model that it still has to this day. The future looked bright for Jamaica. The 1960s was a great decade for the fledgling state. The economy shifted away from agriculture to bauxite mining, tourism, low-skilled manufacturing and private investment. <laughs> during the 60s, and the Jamaican economy grew at an average of 6% per annum. It seemed that the post-imperial dream was finally coming true. Unfortunately, things took a turn for the worse in the 1970s, though. The global economy slowed down, dragging this small island with it. Rising inequality and resentment against the post-colonial elites led a democratic socialist called Michael Manley to win at the elections. This meant a shift in international relations. Jamaica strengthened its ties with the Soviet Union and started an anti-free market economic agenda. That's why the country began implementing price controls, land expropriations, higher minimum wages, and much more public spending. In theory, many of these reforms could have served Jamaica well. Mr. Manley introduced great things like free public education, maternity leave, and all kinds of social programs. <laughs> price controls and the market restrictions meant all those good intentions 
never materialized. Mr. Manley, openly praising Cuban communist leader Fidel Castro, didn't exactly smooth relations over with the United States, so as a result, foreign investment all but disappeared, and the middle class left the country in droves. During those years, the country went into double-digit inflation, and the price controls led to regular shortages of even basic goods. By 1980, Jamaicans had lost patience with Manley's socialist utopia that had never really materialized, and they voted him out. The right wing, Edward Seeger, took power and then courted the US and the UK. Jamaica went from praising Castro to helping the US with the 1983 invasion of communist Grenada. And I know what you might be thinking right now. So, right after Jamaica started towing the line with the US, everything turned around. Right? Isn't that just the way things go in geopolitics? Well, as always, reality is much more complicated than that. <laughs> Crossroads of Chaos. Jamaica is the place where you can forget about your worries, so much so that no problem, or as they say in the Jamaican dialect, Yamon is a slogan associated with the island. And no, Yamon doesn't mean Yana. But the irony is, Jamaica has lots of problems. Really big problems. extends state of emergency travel warning over high levels of violent crime. You see, to say that Jamaica is actually an incredibly violent country would be an understatement. Jamaica's homicide rate is eight times the global average. In 2005, Jamaica had a rate of 58 homicides per 100,000 people. This was the highest in the world for that year. By 2017, it had gone down to 57 per 100,000, making it only the second highest homicide rate, just below El Salvador and just above Venezuela. A former prime minister called the crime issue a national challenge of unprecedented proportions. The problem isn't new. It began developing in the mid-1970s when both major political parties started giving urban gangs tons of guns and money. As you might expect, lots of people were shot. To make matters worse, the USA started supplying guns to the Labour Party and their gangs, and likewise Cuba and the USSR started supplying guns to the National Party's gangs. <laughs> Yes, I didn't just scramble that last sentence in Jamaica. The Labour Party is actually the right-wing party and the National is the left-wing party. By 1980, almost 800 people would be murdered in political violence, often taking place between politically segregated communities in urban Kingston. The political parties still support gangs to this day, although the gangs have become less dependent on the parties and increasingly dependent on connections in Colombia and on international drug smuggling. So it's no surprise that crime rates haven't improved at all. The nature of Jamaica's economy isn't fantastic either. The island of Jamaica doesn't have a whole lot of resources to offer the world, it's mostly just sugar, coffee, and bauxite. What's more, these are all raw products, not worth a whole lot on their own, and there's plenty of international competition. Another sector of the economy is based on tourism, which can fluctuate suddenly and rapidly, so not exactly a stable foundation. The issue of not having much of value to export is made even worse when you consider that the country also has to import, well, almost everything. Food, medicine, machinery, you name it, it's imported. At the top of the list of imports is petroleum, on which Jamaica is highly dependent, resulting in some of the highest energy costs in the world. All these factors really add up. In 2017, Jamaica had a trade deficit of $4.5 billion. That's a lot for a country of less than 3 million people. So now, what do you get when you cross heavy importing, expensive essential items, and lingering socialist policies? The answer? Well, that would be stagflation. And yes, stagflation is just one of those cool words that you get to learn about when you watch official policy. It means a combination of stagnating economic growth, high unemployment rates, and inflation. And after that, quick economics lesson, it's time for me to ask you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that button. But let's get back to our story. You see, Jamaica has experienced rampant inflation and chronic unemployment for about 50 years. Yes, although Jamaica started out strong, it spent more than 80% of its independent history stuck in an economic rut. Jamaica thought just attracting foreign investors to develop tourism and industry would solve its problems, but with such high inflation and horrific crime rates, they couldn't attract a Sudanese refugee if they tried, let alone Wall Street. But listen closely now, because the winds of change may just fill Jamaica's mothballed sails. A new national strategy has been adopted, and it might just be enough not only to resuscitate Jamaica's economy, but turn it into the envy of the seven seas. Location, location, location.
On the 26th of June 2016, something big happens for the world and the region. A very large ship crossed the Panama Canal. So large, in fact, that prior to that date, a ship of that size couldn't even get through the canal. Yes, that was the day that Panama finished its long-awaited expansion of the canal. This expansion almost doubled the canal's capacity and led to the creation of this new ship size, the new Panamax, as in a ship built to the new maximum specifications of the canal. Over the next 20 months, over 3,000 of these new ships would cross the canal, which has generated new stories like this. The Caribbean share in the global cargo industry is growing rapidly. Forbes, May 2019. And where are all these ships going? Well, pretty much everywhere. For example, goods going from China to Florida, or from Spain to Ecuador, and vice versa. In many cases, they'll pass right by, or even stop, in Jamaica, which is the closest island nation to the canal itself. So why would they stop in Jamaica? Because some of these ships might want to store their commodities for some time before passing the Panama Canal. Others might need fuel or maintenance. And Panama is already full. Having an island next to it comes in very handy, and this is why Jamaica wants to capitalize on its location and become a transit hub not just for the Americas, but for the world. All it needs is a whole lot of infrastructure, like ports, railways, and airport, along with things like dry docks for ship repairs. Now, Jamaica does have some competition from other Caribbean nations, which is putting some pressure on them to act fast, but luckily for Jamaica, their neighbors aren't quite up to the task. <laughs> Haiti and Cuba would be natural competitors, but one's at Somalia's levels of chaos, and the other's still communist and facing U.S. sanctions. Then there's Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory, which is hamstrung with its current administration, I think that's and then finally the Dominican Republic, which is pretty much the only one that could actually compete with Jamaica. If Jamaica does pull this off, it's going to be big, not just for Jamaica, but on a global level. If this works, it'll turn Jamaica from a lame duck into a high flyer. Imagine if this poor nation can really become the next Singapore. The best part really does have a fighting chance. Jamaica is a mostly stable English-speaking democracy and a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. But not only that, it's surrounded by dysfunctional economies and borderline failed states during the start of the golden age of Caribbean shipping. It's already got some of the work done surveying areas for feasibility of new ports, railway lines, and special economic zones. <laughs> The project is looking to get about $28 billion in investment, and the Jamaican government, the World Bank, and several private partners have already made pledges and contributions. Jamaicans wouldn't be the only ones getting richer either. As new infrastructure develops, more cargoes could be shipped more quickly. This would lower costs for many populations of the world and thus increase competition. But with this competition, Europeans can experience fresher and cheaper Peruvian mangoes, and aid from Canada to Venezuela would arrive much more quickly and be cheaper. Even stuff like your speciality imported anime body pillow would be cheaper if you're somewhere like New York. Jamaica would get a boost, and the entire global economy would too. So the question now goes over to you. Do you think it will work? Will this new, very expensive infrastructure materialize? Will Kingston become a city of the global elite like Singapore? Or is Jamaica doomed to remain in its cycle of crime and of poverty? Well, we'd love to hear your answer in the comments below, and please do also visit our friends at reconsidermedia.com. They're the podcast that provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Also, don't forget, we publish brand new videos every week, so subscribe to Visual Politic, hit that bell button so you don't miss any posts, and if you like this video, please do give us a thumbs up, and... Yeah, that was a Visio Politics, so yeah, V-I-S-I-O Politics, and you can always, um, like you said, I found it, so I've decided to subscribe, but I would be interested in your feedback. I mean, some, once you start watching it, you kind of think it's all negative, 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 and then you kind of hear the positive, and it's just interesting take on it. So, any comments would be appreciated. That's all for now.